and finally to Vietnam, where our correspondent embarked on a more personal mission while he was filming a travel documentary. Along the way, he laid his elder brother's ashes to rest at his family's temple in Ho Chi Minh City. William Lee Adams said he had to overcome a number of barriers to make this trip possible, both political and cultural, but ultimately he fulfilled his long-time wish to return his brother to his original home. I'm standing in a pagoda in Vietnam, clutching the marble urn that contains the ashes of my late brother John. I've carried them across the world to our family temple, hoping to boost the chances that John will be reborn into a better life. John, 54 at the time he died, stares at me from a childhood photograph perched on the altar. Between us is a small table with food, rice, pickled vegetables, watermelon, tea, offerings to feed his soul. A monk in a saffron robe dings a golden bell and invites John's spirit to the ceremony. To help John find his way, the monk chants our precise location, Guan Ba, Chet Van Chui, Dain Fa O Chi Man, District 3. Banana Garden Market, Ho Chi Minh City. I'm not sure John needs the directions. He was born here in 1968, at the height of the Vietnam War. As a boy, he played on its labyrinthine alleyways, which run past my aunt's market stall, and would hide coins among the shelves of cooking oil, dried beans, and biscuits, challenging passers-by to find them. But polio cut short his playtime. He came to rely on crutches, and later a wheelchair, and family who carried him on their backs— the virus also attacked his brain. By 1981, the year I was born, my family had moved to Atlanta. Doctors there said John, then 13, would forever have the mind of a three-year-old. During the ceremony at the pagoda, we burn incense, the fragrant smoke said to link our world with the world of the spirits. Looking through that swirling haze, I'm lost in my childhood memories. Emptying the plastic urinal that sat between John's legs, the feeling of John's soft skin as I helped my mom lift him onto the toilet, reading to him from National Geographic magazines and telling him about all the places I wanted us to travel together, only to realize that would never happen. I cried that day. John couldn't talk, but he responded as he always did, with a laugh so sweet and joyous it cut through my sadness. The monk and I aren't alone. My aunt, who burns incense for our ancestors here every night, stands next to me, and behind us, their cameras pointed, are two colleagues from the BBC. We're filming a documentary. Our program wasn't the motivation for this trip. I'd always wanted to bring my brother's ashes back to Vietnam, a country he never asked to leave, and the place where he once ran happy and free. But I lacked the courage to express those feelings openly, and to say out loud that I wanted to make this trip to thank him for the life we shared. Surely my grief paled in comparison to my mother's, She'd suffered the ultimate sadness, outliving her child. The excuse of work gave me cover to ask her for John's urn, and to speak about the pain I still carry. My mother didn't mind giving me the ashes. She tucked them away in a sock drawer for safekeeping. But she did have one request. I should ask the monk to pray for John's soul, so that in his next life he might once again walk and run. I don't know the name of the monk at the pagoda when I get to Ho Chi Minh City, my family call him teacher. After the ceremony, we sit on the floor in the shadow of a golden Buddha. I ask teacher if I've done the right thing for my brother. The best thing you could have done was to bring him here, he says. This pagoda is the bridge to his next life. We'll feed and nourish his soul every day. Through prayer and the other spirits, he'll learn the right path. He won't carry the shortcomings of this life into the next. The ashes, my last tangible connection to my very first friend, will remain in the temple when I return to London. Teacher tells me not to worry. In the spiritual world, there is no near. There is no far, he says. Look at the distant sun. The light enters your heart immediately. My aunt and teacher walk to the ground floor to share a plate of fruit. I stay upstairs with my colleagues and stretch my arm over the edge of a red balcony to record some sound. Motorcycles whiz down the alleyway and children play, yet the temple feels still and silent. A breeze runs up my arms and through some dangling chimes. Their gentle echo sounds a lot like a laugh. William Lee Adams. And you can watch William's documentary, Vietnam Return to Banana Garden Market, on the BBC iPlayer. <laughs>